So now uh, with us uh, live uh, via Zoom, uh, we're joined by the Chief Rabbi of Ukraine, Rabbi Bleich. How are you? Okay, great. How are you doing, Sviga? I'm okay. You know, we're living uh, during interesting times. Um, uh, and, you know, there's many news going on all the time. On the one hand, you know, we have the war, uh, the wars in Ukraine and in Israel continuing. Um, a new president is elected um, in the United States, uh, Donald Trump. And, you know, we've been discussing kind of how that will possibly affect um, the relations with Israel, with Ukraine. Um, what's your take on that? You mean uh, between the United States and Israel, and the United States and Ukraine? Oh, United States First and Israel, of all, but also United States. Well, no, that's... but also United States and Ukraine, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. One, one thing that I think is quite obvious is that Trump is coming in to the to his presidency much differently than he did the first time. He's coming in, sort of, you know, trying to hit the floor running, and he's getting stuff moving, and you're hearing, um, I think, much more responsible. Uh, let's say, announcements and stuff than, than the first time when he was, you know, not experienced and maybe didn't know exactly what he was getting himself yeah, into. Yeah, he wasn't a politician. He didn't grow up in government. He was, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going into the excuse. I'm saying the fact. Yeah. The observation. So uh, his, his whole, all of the statements that he made about Ukraine really opened a door, I think, for, for him, for Ukraine, for the United States, to really try and do something. The question is what he wants to do. I don't think that it's possible for him to make peace between Russia and Ukraine because the differences are so uh, so large. But the divide is great. I think something much more realistic that may be possible is sort of a ceasefire to stop the killing of innocent civilians. You know, basically, if you see what's going on now, most of the, the attacks that Russia is doing are hitting you know houses every single day many many civilians are being killed in every single city that russia attacks and i think that's something that really should stop there's also a lot of killing going on obviously a lot of death on the russian side the soldiers uh you know thousands over a thousand soldiers uh, some days close to two thousand even being shot wounded killed taken out in on the russian side which is also the whole the, really, the whole thing is sort of senseless at this point, because uh, we don't know what who wanted, what he had in mind when he started this war. But it's obvious that he didn't destroy Ukraine as a state. He did cause a lot of damage and is causing a lot of death and causing a lot of suffering. But is that going to lead to what he thinks it will? And, you know, what's the end game here? Mm -hmm. So I think that something to, to really focus on, we try, we try to get the killing stopped. And I think that uh, he may be positioned if if he's able to, like some of his people said, you know, tell Zelensky that you sit down at the table or we'll stop giving you arms and tell Putin either you sit down at the table or we'll give them all the arms that they need. Because if Ukraine would get everything they needed and the ability to shoot into Russia, I think this war would be over, uh, you know, pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, we have seen that Western arms are much by far superior to anything that the Russians have put out. And, um, it, you yeah. know, it would be unfortunate to have to go that way. It makes much more sense. Just stop the killing now and then try and get to sit down by the table. So, Rabbi Blake, the, the what, problems, what's... One of the problems that I, yeah. you know, could just say as an observer, because we were invited by uh, President Zelensky, the Council of Church and Religious Organizations, to observe the negotiations before this war is that the Russians are professional negotiators. They could negotiate to death. Yeah. Without saying anything or giving anything. Mm -hmm. they, they have a lot of years of negotiations that they could uh, get under their belt. So Rabbi, Blech, point, Rabbi uh, Blech, what's the situation of the Jewish communities in Ukraine? I mean, at the beginning, there was a lot of mobilization. Some people left. Some people came back. So at, at the beginning of the war, a lot of uh, Ukrainians left, including Jews. Mm -hmm. But a lot of Ukrainians, millions of Ukrainians left and the Jewish community among them especially the places that they thought Russia would come into. And we see that wherever Russia came in, they basically destroyed the cities, killed men, women, children indiscriminately. You know, that's what was going on in Bucha and the other cities around around uh, Kiev. And the same thing happened in the east, uh, in Mariupol and the other cities. Basically, the Russians didn't have the goal of capturing the city as 
as much as it had a goal of destroying the city and making it uninhabitable. So people left because of that. When the Russians pulled back, so many people came back. Uh, the Jewish communities are all up and running. No Jewish community has closed due to lack of interest. And uh, most of the rabbis were back. And uh, almost all the synagogues are working for sure on Shabbos and on the holidays. Um, it's hard to say, though, that, you know, how many Jews came back and how much of it is new people that are coming to the synagogue. You know, all of the communities in, in Ukraine are Kirov communities, mm -hmm. which are outreach communities are bringing in new people all the time. Right. So I can tell you that in Kiev, in, in the community that I'm the rabbi of, uh, there are a lot of uh, new people, really, really a lot of That's new people. That's what I was going to ask. I assume a lot of people moved and they may even stay. Yeah, it depends where they are. I'm getting uh, calls now from many Jews from Kiev that went to places in Europe that are making Aliyah to Israel now. Mm -hmm. You're talking about two plus years, you know, almost three years yeah, down yeah. the road, and two suddenly they, you know, they see whatever. Let's not forget that Europe is sort of, especially, you know, some of the countries in Europe are are not very hospitable for Jews, especially what's happening now. Yeah, you know, what the Amsterdam thing is just, it's not a, it's a siman, not a siba. You know, it's more of a sign mm -hmm. of what's happening all over. Not a it's reason. It's not so much. Yeah. Uh, it's not a reason. Yeah. But the same, you know, this is what's happening in England. Look at France. I, I would estimate that the Jewish population of France is down, you know, tens of percentages since, you know, in the last six, seven years. I I think that Great Britain is also going to have a, an exodus because you see the amount of anti-Semitic attacks there. Um, and a lot of other Western European countries are, uh, you know, people are going to be making Aliyah. Israel is going to be growing. That's why I'm in Israel now, mm -hmm. trying to set something up here for Ukrainian immigrants. Wow. You no know, place that they can, you know, feel a community. When they come, they should come into a place that's, you know, feels like home. That's amazing. You know, it's interesting how you you went and became a rabbi in Ukraine, and obviously we hear your accent. You're American, um, and now you're also enabling Aliyah to Israel. You know, immigration to Israel. It, it, I don't think is this something you ever thought you would be doing. Thousand percent. I've been doing it since my day one, almost. Actually, that wasn't a very they, smart question, <laughs> uh, but whatever. But yeah, I mean, definitely. Since I'm sure, yeah, since yeah, you've yeah. been there, there's been yeah, a we, we, huge we, wave of Aliyah, yeah, but thousands but not, and thousands of yeah. Olim, yeah, you know, from our community. So uh, it's just that I think that the but organization, it's a new, it's a new I situation think it's now. In Israel to create that communal infrastructure that when people come, they know where they're going. They have a synagogue to go to. They have a community center. They have a rabbi who speaks their language and understands their mentality. That they can continue being Jewish in whatever shape or form they were Jewish before. Right. You know, because Israel, I think the, I think the, the divisions are a little bit too. I think the difference know, between those that that made Aliyah, let's say, at the beginning of the '90s, okay, and those making Aliyah now, because of the strengthening of Jewish identity and the amount of rabbis and Jewish communities that kind of re were reestablished, and as you said. Outward, uh, outreach communities, right? So now people who will move to Israel aren't looking for that secular Jewish life. They're looking for Jewish life the way they had it in Ukraine. And it would be very difficult to find if you don't create some sort of a atmosphere like that. Well, it's true, yeah. Because in, in, in the Ukrainian Jewish communities, all of the communities throughout Ukraine, every single one of them, nobody cares, you know, initially when you come in, Nobody asks you, are you religious? What do you keep? What don't you keep? Mm -hmm. Do you wear, you know, a kippah? Do you don't wear a kippah? You can have, like I say, in one synagogue, uh, guys with strimals, guys with a kippah surga, and a guy without any kippah. Right. And they're all celebrating Hanukkah, Purim, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, or even Shabbos together, right? It, that's the, the nature of the diaspora, especially in, in the outreach communities, is that nobody asks questions. You just come if you're Jewish and you're part of the community. And I think if we created something like that in Israel, it would knock down those boundaries that are artificial boundaries that are dividing Jews. Uh, you know, I think that it would be a, it would go a long way in uniting the Jews, the Jews in Israel as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm not looking to change the world. But I think that for the at least the Ukrainian Jews that come here, they should have a place that they can feel that it's that home. You know, That's like amazing. home again. I'm saying I, the, my motto is 
you know, be in Israel and feel like you're in Ukraine, you know. Some right. people may not like that too much. Yeah, but, but, uh, yeah. but that's feel, the way it is. You feel you know, you comfortable. You make people feel, feel at home and they feel comfortable. 100%. Yeah. Americans are trying to get a Ramat Bay Chemish. Okay. Some of the communities, and some of them are quite successful. Okay. A lot of challenges, but uh, there's a lot to learn from. 100%. So uh, Rabbi Bleich, uh, Chief Rabbi of Ukraine, now in Israel, trying to help um, Ukrainian immigrants uh, to move to Israel. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you for doing what you do. And uh, hopefully we should be hearing good news about ending the war very soon, um, as well as uh, ending the war in Israel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the entire, you know, Kiev Jewish Forum for everything that uh, that you're doing together with us on this. I think it's a great thing. It's a great forum. People can get to hear about one another in a very interesting way from different parts of the world. And uh, in in that way, you're also bringing us all together. Hundred percent. So uh, and thank you yeah, to Boris so uh, to Boris Lozhkin for uh, for you know inventing this forum and for keeping it going. And hopefully, you'll yeah, be the, able the to go Jewish back physically. Ukraine, you'll right. be able to host us in Kiev next year. Yeah, and, and we say next year in Jerusalem, but you could say next year in Kiev. Next year in Kiev, not yeah, <laughs> in in a in a very specific way. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thanks a lot, Stay well.